welcome you to the Dogwood Hill Baptist Church this morning. What a beautiful crowd we have. Amen. At this time, we just want you to take a few moments in fellowship. Like I said, you don't have to shake hands, but you can do this right here. Yeah. Make sure you don't draw by him. <laughs> Good to be at God's house, amen. amen. Thank you, media, for joining us today at this worship time here at Dogwood Hill Baptist Church. Brother Jimmy, good to see you. Praise the Lord. I, I see Joanne nudged you on out here. We Jimmys, we have to have some nudging. Y'all don't know what that is. I, me and Jimmy can tell you we've been married 50-odd years. <laughs> oh glory I can't believe how some of some of you I tell you what mm. wow growing. we want to go to prayer we do have pre special prayer requests this morning Sister Pat Davis had another episode with atrial fib and she was running 170 180 heartbeats a minute blood pressure dropped down extremely low yesterday and she refused to go to the hospital she just started drinking some Pedialyte and tried to be resting and I, it finally come back down last night about 10 o'clock but remember sister pat davis as she's uh going through all she's going through with right now afib ain't nothing easy to deal with folks and it will drop your blood pressure but keep pat da and grady too uh me and grady's got to go to charleston tomorrow down at mount pleasant get a shot in his back and uh, uh pray for us for a safe journey i asked billy she have my earplugs did you hear that grady <laughs> I love him. Oh, I love him. Yes, I do. Uh, thank God for him. M remember, Glenda Ellisor, she recovers from uh, with her back surgery. And Denise Merle Lewis, uh, continue to remember her. Uh, I guess she's still down in Charleston. Does anybody know different? I guess she's still down in Charleston. Uh, still can remember Hoyt Raven. He come home. He's doing a lot better, but he sure has lost some weight. Y'all remember Hoyt Raven? Anybody else got a prayer request? Oh, yeah, David Corbett. We need to remember him over here at Tabor City. Got some special needs. Di Diana? Remember your dad? Is it back with his heart again? Aneurysm, okay. Remember her dad. All right, Brother Laverne? Really? Oh, mercy. Miss, remember Sister Gail? Uh, that back trouble's a mess. Been there and done that, ain't we, Carrie? Wow. Anybody else? I see another hand gun up, Glenda. Okay. Fred.
Fred McKinney. Hickory, North Carolina, Fred McKinney. Jimmy? Amen. Jimmy's like the bunny with beating the drum. He just keeps going. Praise God. God's got to work for him. Praise you. It's Nancy. I heard. Uh, I don't know him personally, but I read it on Facebook that they sent him home and said it may be just a matter of days. Said it's advanced. Remember my son-in-law, our son-in-law, mine, Billy's? He's got to go for some biopsy this week on his liver. Uh, afraid that we're hoping he ain't got the same thing that his mama's got and his grandma had. Is, uh, they said that type of problem can be inherited. So pray for our son-in-law that he's not got that. Anybody else? Yeah. My mercy. Well, I remember back to home when I was young, we said we sure would be glad when the weather finally sprung and things got better. Joanne? Amen, sister. Remember Miss Mathy? Yes, sir. Billy Gore? Okay. My mercy, Miss Billy Gore is in Myrtle Beach Manor. Well, glory. Amen. Well, just keep exercising. Yeah, say praise the Lord, glory to God. Amen. Anybody else, brother? John, Mr. Johnny Norris. Let's continue to remember him as he's experiencing some serious sickness now. Had a heavy duty surgery, but uh, let's pray for his recovery. Johnny Norris. Anyone else? Fifty years old. Angela's her name. Sherry's friend Angela needs to be remembered in a prayer request today. Uh, only fifty years old and <laughs> confined to the house. Brother Grady had an MRI yesterday. Uh, I, I don't know the results of it yet. They're checking, uh, they're hoping he don't have a tumor. He's having some problems with vision. So pray for Brother Grady Davis concerning that too. Anyone else? We got Praise God. Remember Kevin Ivey, that's Stephen's brother in law. Uh, he's having some interviews. He's, his company just downsized and done away with his job. And he'd been there several years. And he's not found a job since. And that's been probably three months since January. That's hard on the family, folks. Pray for Kevin Ivey that he's go for those interviews this week and that God give him a job that he wants him to have. Amen? Anyone else? Maybe by that lifted hand. God knows. Lift that hand up, Stuart. There you go. Heavenly Father, as we come home to you this morning, Lord, I thank you. I see so many hands going up. I see them, dear God, that's got great needs in their life. God, I pray for Kevin Ivey as he goes this week for interviews. God, that you would open the door there and give that man a job that you would have him to have. I feel like you have a calling on him, Lord, and, and I certainly know that he loves you, Lord. He's professed that out openly. 
God, we pray this morning for these of us that are physically ill in the body. Lord, I pray that you would minister unto them. Thank you, dear. That brother Jimmy Vaught's with us this morning. Miss Joanne, pray for Miss Mayfield. Lord, all those that are in the nursing home, Mr. John, all the others that are in the nursing home, dear God, I pray for them this morning. Lord, there's a great need there. And Lord, as Joanne said, she's got a private request. God, we don't have to voice everything. You know everything about us. You know our very existence and our being. God, we pray that you'd minister unto that need this morning. And God, I pray for those that know you not in the pardon and forgiveness of sin. Lord, there's a lot of lost people in the world today, and they're not reaching out to you. God, they seem to be satisfied. Uh, with what they got, dear God. Uh, well, it may be that you just uh, have to take it all away, dear Lord, to where people can get back on their knees and realize that you are God and that you are still in charge. I pray for the Ukraine situation. Lord, as they're coming back strong there against the Russian resistance. Oh, God, I pray that you'd bless them this morning. And, God, that you would just minister to, to the leadership of the U Ukraine, dear God, that they would reach out there and, and Lord, accept what's given unto them and rebuild their country of what this uh, neighboring country, Lord, has had to destroy it. That should not be so. Father, we pray this morning that you'd minister to us, you dog would. Lord, through the leadership of the Holy Spirit, some there, even as what Sister Sherry is talking about her friend, Angela. Oh, God bless her, Lord. She's only 50 years old and confined to the house. Oh, that's tough, Lord. God, I pray for all of us. And we're getting older, God. I pray for Brother Bill this morning as he comes to speak to us. He's a man that's with a group of people. I could preach on that this morning, the Gideon ministry. Oh, Lord, how great they are in our world society, not just here in South Carolina, but everywhere throughout the world you can find Gideon Bibles. Thank you, Lord, for that. Bless us and help us to be obedient unto you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh... Let's don't forget our uh, service this morning. We are going to have two offerings today, so you don't be confused. First offering will be our normal offering for the church, and then at the end of the service, we're going to take up an offering for the Gideon. And we love the Gideon here. We support the Gideon. And we pray that we could uh, uh, have a good offering for that. Uh, this coming Wednesday night, we're going to have our normal uh, business meeting at 7 o'clock with finance meeting at 630 uh, let's don't forget that. Communion next Sunday. Uh, we're going to have a communion. Hadn't had that in a while. We need to get back into that. Food ministry is the 16th. Uh, so that means we're going to have a, a truck delivery there on the Wednesday before. Uh, Easter sunrise service is at 630. And we'll eat afterwards. And then we'll come back for regular services at 945 and 1045. Uh, BBS, let's don't forget about that. Sister Sherry has not been overwhelmed, but her book's getting a little few names on it out there on the table I saw there. A few names just got signed up. Uh, let her know, friends, what we want to do, how we want to help at BBS. Um, also, the 21st, we are going to have a booth out here at Green Sea Floyd's high school, middle school, and they're allowing us to hand out Stuff concerning God's Word. Uh, we're going to give out some frisbees with Dogwood Hill's name on it. We're going to give out some flyers with our VBS uh, dates on it, inviting them to come. And then May the 6th at Loris High School, we've been, high, I've been invited to have a booth there from 5 to 8. So we're going to need some people to help us there. So that's April the 21st at 4 o'clock in the afternoon at Green Sea Floyd's and May the 6th at 5 o'clock at Loris High School. Preacher, have I missed anything? I think I got, that was a bunch, weren't it? That was a bunch. All right, we still got our, our uh, memory verse here. It was last month, so now I have to get Sonny to change us. Do, got a new one on the screen? Well, I can't see that back counter. What am I gonna do? I'm gonna turn this way. Oh, I know that was right. Let's all stand. We're going to read Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 6, 23. Don't forget that. That's a good one to remember. Amen? All right, Brother Ed, come on, give us a song, and we come take up our first offer.
Our offertory hymn for this morning is 557. In our Baptist hymnal, 557 people need the Lord. Yes, we do. People need the Lord. Lord, as we come to you this morning, Father, we just lift up once again the many requests we've heard for prayer, dear Lord. We just pray that you would intercede on each behalf, whatever the need might be, dear Lord. And Father, we just pray now that you'd bless each person here today, dear Lord, their families. Father, whatever their need might be, just, just have your way and your will in our lives, dear Lord. Help us to be obedient and submissive to the Holy Spirit. And Father, we just pray that you bless this offering, Lord, as we take it up today, Lord. Help us to use it. Help us to use the Gideon offering all in a way to be pleasing to thee, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Preacher, we don't have a special singer, do we? No? Okay. Let's don't do that. Thank you each for your giving this morning. Thank you for being obedient to the Lord. Thank you for visiting us with us here uh, up out of North Carolina and coming to church. That blesses our heart to see visitors. We got some all the way from Virginia. They drove a long way to hear you, Bill. Damn. You just tell them you had people that drove all the way from Virginia to hear you speak. <laughs> no, let's let that go this morning. God's got another man. And uh, I thank you for coming. I really do. Oh, yes, Children's Church, age 3 to 3rd grade. Children's Church, age 3 to 3rd grade. Go ahead and go on out. Thank you. Bless their hearts. 
I'm glad we got a bunch of them. Amen? Amen. That's good. That's churches growing when you see little babies around. Uh, but it's time for Bill Ward to come up here, and I want to give him the pulpit and feel free to speak as God leads him. Uh, he's got a great message for you. I hope of you. I hope he lets us know what did Gideon do. God bless you, Bill Ward. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Looks like you got plenty of water over there. They ran me up, sir. <laughs> Mama, are they going to lock us up? That sounds kind of crazy, doesn't it? But it was coming from a little boy. His name was Fred. Fred was going to visit his dad who was in prison. He didn't understand why he was in prison. He was too young. He was kind of maybe five, six years old. He had a couple of little sisters that was tagging along there with him. Said the time had... Uh, uh, was hard, and this testimony comes from, I don't exactly remember the date, but uh, probably more than 50 years ago. Wow. I think it's good that we share these sometimes to let you know the ministry's been around since 1898. Wow. And uh, when it was first formed, and of course we weren't that expanded that way at uh, that time, but this was a USA testimony. But the times was hard. He was put in jail for some reason. It was a penitentiary. I don't know how long he had, but I know it had been some time. And back then, it was hard for ladies who were raising children. They didn't have jobs regularly like they do today. And no, it was, she, she had a hard time. She had a lot of friends, and she had people in the community, but she still had to do what she could do to make sure that there was food on the table and a place for the children to stay. And I'm telling this in the, in the words of Fred. It says, one day Mom told me we were going to visit my dad. We were all so excited. I've been to prisons and witnessed to me. It's a sad, sad thing. It's a sad, sad thing. But, you know, I, I was talking at Rikers Island a few years ago to a group of men who were incarcerated there and the thing came to me that I needed to share with those men was they could be forgiven. Amen. I says, you may have went into a grocery store and looked both ways and got a handful of grapes. Or you might have stole a Lamborghini. It's all the same thing. In God's eyes, it was wrong. It was a sin against him. And all of you can be forgiven. I shared the scripture with them, Romans Road. Invited them to come to Jesus as Savior. And 21 rugged old guys with tattoos and everything you can imagine came and bowed down at the altar. Amen. That's a powerful thing to see men who don't feel like they got no hope, but they're offered hope and they accept it. Many don't. Many go through a lot of uh, problems when they do receive salvation in prison, but we're so thankful for those that do. And I know you might say, uh, that's prison, prison religion. I talked to a young man afterwards, and he said, I've been in here for 245 days because I can't make bail. He stole the car. He said, I was guilty of what I did. He said, I may take and do my whole thing here, whatever time served is. He said, I might be right here in Rikers Island the whole time, but... He said, God is real, and God's going to carry me through it all. Amen. He asked for forgiveness. and He was already a Christian, but he was, con he was helping the other men as they were there. But times were hard for this family. And the one day the mom says, we're going to see Dad in the prison. He said, as we traveled, I couldn't wait. We was riding that old bus, and I couldn't wait to get there to see my dad. Said, as we got to the penitentiary, though, I saw a lot of fences and barbed wire, very drab looking big buildings. As we went inside, we passed by guards, slammed the door right behind us. I was scared to death. Mm. 
And he said, then we walked into a large room where several other children and parents were waiting. He said, we sat. And their big door opened. We could see a long line of men, all of them dressed the same way, walking into the room. Then we saw our dad. The whole room got real noisy. As the men came in, and children began calling out their fathers wow. with great excitement. If you think about this testimony from a child's standpoint, it breaks your heart. Yeah, it does. Dad sat down with us, and we talked a while. He said, I was so excited, I don't even know what we talked about. I can't remember, but he said, I remember him pulling a little book out of his pocket, and at that time, prison testimonies were black, just like this. And he said he took that book out of his pocket, and I remember him taking that book and handing it to Mom, and he said, I read this, and it changed my life completely and saved. Right. Amen. He said, take it home and read it to the children. I remember leaving that day, and as we walked by the guards, I was fearful that they would arrest us for stealing that book out of the prison. <laughs> Sounded kind of funny, but to him, he was scared to death. Scared. He said, they're going to lock us up, but he said, I heard that last steel door slam, and I felt we were okay. He says, every evening at home, Mom would gather us around the heater. Y'all remember gathering around the heater? Yes, sir. I had an oil heater sometime, or a oil gas heater, or a wood heater. And that's where you gather around and talk in the evening time. And Mom would gather us around the heater, and she'd read that book to us, and she told us about Jesus. Then we started attending church, and one Sunday a Gideon man came. That's what he called him. All I know, he was a Gideon man, and he came, and he spoke about people reading a book like ours and being saved. He said, I told Mom we needed to give something to pay for that one. And we took. The Gideon man came every year. So Mom kept giving. He said, I'm sure we paid for it by now. Over the years, Mom kept reading to us, and one by one, we were all saved, all children. Praise God. He said, I grew up and I was called to preach. I've pastored for many years, and will never forget that little book. Through it, the Lord spoke to my heart and saved me from my sin. Praise God. You see, we don't really ever know the total results that come from the placement of God's Word. We don't ever know. Sometimes we think, ah, it's going to be thrown in a trash can. It's going to be here. It's going to be there. They're never going to read it. I got testimonies of one particular woman called Carolyn. She jumped out of a she jumped out of a cab at Queens College in New York and ran up to a, one of our members from Dillon, South Carolina, and said, "Thank you so much for giving me this Bible." Praise he God. said, "I didn't recognize her. I don't know what she was talking about, but he said I just listened." She said, 20 years ago, I was coming out of these gates right here, and you were standing here and gave me this Bible, and she took it out, a Green College Testament. She said, through a hard time in my life, she said, I carried it from pocketbook to pocketbook or purse to purse, and she said, I never read it for 20 years. She said, it had makeup all over it, lipstick, and everything else. But she said, for some reason, I kept moving it from one purse to the next. She said, my husband left me and ran off with another woman. A hard time came in my life, and I didn't know what to do. But she said, I remember that man giving me that book and saying, herein is eternal life. If you'll read the scripture, it'll become real to you, and you can live. You can have life. She said, I wanted something more than what I had, and I began to read. And she said, the Lord spoke to me and saved me, and ever since I've been a committed right. Christian. He carried me through what I was needing to be carried through. Praise God for someone willing, a church willing to give the dollar and 35 cent, and for a man who was willing to go from South Carolina to New York to hand it out, Amen. and for her to receive it. And God gave the increase. Yes. 
Praise the Lord for that. We're so thankful for you, church, for that that you do for this ministry. I know that some people, every time I stand somewhere, I don't like to give a lot of statistics and say where we come from and all that kind of stuff, but I always find somebody that's never heard a Gideon message. Is there anybody here that's never heard a Gideon message? Okay, we got one, two. We got some, so I need to go through that. And maybe some of us forget, you know. But again, this international is a Christian business professional men's organization organized in over 200 countries, placing the Word of God in over 100 languages today. Distrib distributions are made in hotels, motels, buses, planes, and trains, and other modes of passenger conveyance, hospitals, nursing homes, students of public schools, and places of higher education, first responders, military and penal institutions, and the medical profession. The ladies auxiliary, which are our wives, distribute the nursing profession and medical personnel, doctors and dentist offices, and in camp areas of responsibility. We serve as an extension to the local church, and members must come through recommendation of the pastor. Amen. I called a pastor about a man one time, and I said, I'm thinking about asking him to become one of our members. And I said, what can you tell me about this brother? He said, I can't recommend him. That was kind of strange. I said, he's in regular attendance, isn't he? He said, yes. I said, he's a, a deacon. Yes. But he says, he's not committed to me, the church, or God. I can't recommend him to you. I said, praise God, I ask you first. Yeah. I said, we'll pray together about that maybe one day things will change. But they have to be recommended by a pastor, and so it should be. Yeah. You know, we find a lot of times men join our organization, and they don't last very long. It's not because they're bad people. It's not because they've done anything wrong. It's simply because they were not called to this ministry. That's, that's just all it is. It is a called ministry. We ask for recommendation to pastor. We get an opportunity to talk with the men if they feel a calling, if they feel they need to do something more for the Lord and they've been drawn that way, most of the time that's the case. And they make wonderful men who will serve a lifetime. I started serving in 1986. Never missed very many prayer meetings, monthly meetings, or anything else. And I'm so glad that God placed me where he placed me. I remember the day it happened. A little personal testimony for me. I was working 14 hours a day in the car business. And I, I was asked to become one. My pastor recommended me, Brother Haywood Fowler at that time. He recommended me to be in the organization. And, and I was fighting it. I didn't really want to take the time to do it. I told their leader, we had a, a man who come and trained us for eight months. He drove from Marion every Saturday morning for training. And he come by every Saturday morning. He said, Brother Bill, he said, God wants you in this ministry. I joined that night, they had a big meeting, and I joined because I believed in the ministry, but I just didn't believe I had time. And every Saturday morning, he came by, he said, Bill, we missed you at prayer meeting, God wants you in this ministry. Mm -hmm. It was about eight weeks, every Saturday morning. I finally told him, I said, I'm going next Saturday morning, if you come by my office again, I'm going to throw you off the porch. <laughs> We'd become that close. He said, okay, that's all I ask you. I went that Saturday morning at Brother Austin Graham's furniture store, uh -huh. and right there around that little glass table where the, the floor samples were for your carpet and your linoleum and this, that, and the other, that's where we had our prayer meeting. And when, I, when we bow on our knees to pray, and after we have prayer requests and different things, we read the scripture and we pray, and the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, this is where I want you. I'd already been a member for two months. But God called me to ministry that day. I thank God he did. It's been such a blessing to me. It's helped me in my Christian growth more than anything that's ever happened. Because I've been put on the line. I've been put in a place many times where I wouldn't have if God hadn't have been with me and drawn me to be that place. Organization was uh, 
We have opportunities of reaching areas and communities unlike most other ministries. Our members already live there. They're a part of everyday life. In every country we go to, we do the same distribution program in every country, a full Amen. distribution. And those men who are called to be in camps in those areas, what we call camps, are a part of everyday life in that community. They're connected by occupation, language, community involvement, and they don't need to learn the language or the area. The only expense is the cost of the scripture. That's all it costs them. You're a missionary in over 200 countries today, and all it costs is the Bibles that you buy. Every man works at, uh, at the behest of God. They are not paid. They all volunteer. I wanted to remind you, too, we pray for your church. We pray for your pastor. Uh, Brother Jimmy and you and Brother Brandon may not know it, but on the eighth day of each month, we have a specific prayer for you too Thank you. and for this church. Thank you. And we pray for all our pastors in our church area, in our, in our camp area. I want to share a testimony from a hotel testimony or a hotel Bible. It's, simple. it's like the one I'm carrying right here. You've seen it before if you've oh, been yeah. to a hotel. And... Uh, it says, during the time of uncertainty in my life, a business uh, trip took me to the city of Bangalore. In the solitude and quietness of my hotel room, one evening I was confronted by my Savior through a Gideon Place Bible. God put into me that evening a strong urge not to go to the bars. He said, I had a lot of love for alcohol, and on these business trips I did a lot of drinking. He says, it was put into me to spend my entire evening reading the Bible. I don't know why. He said, I had never done that before. He said, I found it. He was sitting there in the nightstand. I had already seen it when I checked in. As I started reading, everything appeared to be very challenging. And if you start in some places the Bible and you had not read it very much, it will beat you down pretty quick when you get to the, to the gen genealogies. Yeah. But he said, I moved to another place and the Bible began to speak to me. I was reading the Bible with interest and for a considerable length of time. Here I discovered God's rich mercies to a sinner like me. That's the first thing you got to have. You got to understand that you're a sinner and that you're separated from God. And under a deep conviction of sin, I repented. The Word of God brought light and hope to a sinner like me. Into my darkness, the Word of God brought light and hope into my darkness. And my precious Lord met me and gave me a new life. Praise God. Kneeling beside the bed in an open Bible, I made one of the final transactions with God and totally committed my devastated life into his hands. A great change began to take place in my life, and that's going to happen yeah. immediately. It says, my love for liquor vanished completely. My own people at home were confounded and began to wonder at the transformation that God had graciously brought into my life. That's going to happen too. Yes, that Gideon Place Bible is now one of my precious possessions for I brought it away with me. I am making my family read it every day and am praying that the same miracle of God's grace be repeated in their lives. Right. What a miraculous thing that God can take a man who's sold out on the world. We talked about it in Sunday school this morning. You know, there's something else we kind of hit on Sunday school a little bit this morning was what's going on in the Ukraine. I don't know how many of you know, but uh, uh, Brother Randall Gent, I'm sure you do. Randall's one of our Gideons, and he went on the EAP to the Ukraine, Odessa, which is the biggest port in, in the Ukraine, in 2018 and uh, I like to read this scripture but you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and into the uttermost parts of the earth so we're commanded to go to all the world not just Gideons but Christians we're all commanded to go into the, all the world and share the scripture or share the holiness of God with others everywhere we go. Amen. It might be in a grocery store. It could be in a gas station. It could be anywhere. But it could also be in the Ukraine. The 2018 
EAP, which is an area, uh, extension area program in Odessa, Ukraine. And what the, I'm sorry, extension action program, what it actually is, is when people volunteer to come from all over the world, all over the world, to one place wow. to help local camps do a distribution in a large area. Uh, we do it in New York, we do it in Orlando, Atlanta, we do it in all kinds of places, and people come from all over the world, and we spend five or six days, in this case it was ten days, uh, in a foreign place, placing, helping do the same distributions we do here. Brother Randall Gent participated in the Blitz. There were 94,247 scriptures placed. There were many, many people come to the Lord. Randall tells of some of the most miraculous salvations that I've ever heard in my life. People who understood what he was saying that didn't even understand the English language. He said, I saw the Pentecost, the day of Pentecost happened. He said, I spoke to a man, and he said he just, just fell. And he said the Holy Spirit just went all over him. And my translator, he was asking him what happened to him. He said, all I said was two sentences. And he said, he asked the interpreter that was with him, he said, what is he saying? He says, he told me this, what he had just said. And he said, I'm lost, and I'm going to hell. And he said, I need to be saved. And so Amen. through the translator, Randall was able to lead him to salvation. Praise God for his miraculous power. The population of the, U of the Ukraine is 4.4 million people. They 7% Catholic, 65% Russian Orthodox, 2% Protestant Evangelical. That's all. There's 2,200 Christian Gideons in that country, in the whole country, 2,200. There's 204 camps uh, spread out through all the nation. 1.2 million scriptures were placed in 2020. God knew what was happening. He did. Soldiers had Bibles. Hospitals had testimonies. Nurses had them. Police officers had them. School, school students had them. Thank God. They had opportunities to have it in their hand when the time came. 44 million Bibles have been placed in the Ukraine since 1989. Now, why 1989 is so important? That was when they became an independent country away from the Soviet Union. Yes, sir. But guess what's happening now? They're trying to be drawn back in. Many products are exported from the Ukraine regularly, a large percentage of corn, wheat, and metal ores. These are all needed by the world, and specifically the United States needs a lot of them. We're seeing a reaction from a knee jerk from exports being off the market. This is only being beginning to unfold at the sanctions on Russia are causing these reactions here and abroad for few and other centuries. The heartbreaking, unprovoked attack on a small country by a superpower is a humanitarian nightmare. Yes, it is. I tell you what, it breaks my heart to see those people carrying children. I'm reminded of that scripture. I got a great grandchild. She stays, uh, she stays with us, me and Janice, three days a week. We having a time with Stella Ray. I tell you what, we older than we thought we were, but uh. Um, but we love her. She's such a sweet baby. And, and every time I look at those mothers carrying those children, I'm reminded of that scripture. It says, Woe unto them who give suck in those days. Can you imagine how it would be to be blown away from your home and have to walk around in a cold, dark, miserable place with an infant child? Not knowing where the food was going to be coming from. Lord. Not knowing where you were going to sleep or lay that child down. This is a terrible thing that's going on, folks. Lord. <clears throat> Through it all, I'm going to tell you something. We see all those children's parents suffering and dying at the hands of one man's ego. It's a tremendous crime. It should remind us of the possibility of such a thing happening on our soil. You might think that's not never going to happen, but I'm going to tell you, woe unto those who give such on those final days. 
Through it all we learn the evil which exists in men's hearts. The only answer is salvation through Jesus Christ. Amen. That will carry us through the battles that we may have to face today. Tomorrow. The next day. Right. We need it. We have to have it. We can't get by without it. Over the last four weeks, the Gideons International has extended emergency distribution to the Ukraine. This means that all scripture is freely given to anyone at any time. Local Gideons are working in their communities and witnessing of the love of Jesus. You're not going to see that on the news, folks. You're not going to see nothing like that on the news. But these men and women were, were talking to the interpreters. Randall uh, made friends with several interpreters out there, college students and different things, and he made contact uh, this past week. Uh, so far in Odessa, where they were, they were working out of Odessa. In Odessa, there hadn't been a lot of uh, problems there. They hadn't had bombing and this, that, and the other. Uh, probably going to be careful about tearing the port city all to pieces because it's going to be important. It'll be very expensive to reel back, build back. But anyway, the thing of it is, people all over the Ukraine are suffering everywhere. Yes, they're they suffering are. in many, many ways. But they're all okay right now, the whole team, all the Gideons, as far as we know, they're safe at this particular time. The citizens of the Ukraine, thank you for your gifts to supply the Word of God. They just will be saying, thank you, Dogwood Hills, for what you do. Y'all have given so much through the years, so much. So many churches in our area have given so much to place Bibles in areas of people that they don't know and will never see. Well, that's the way Jesus teaches us. He Amen. says, go into all the world teaching, baptizing, and bringing those to salvation. I'm so thankful to be a part of the Christian organization in the world today. Amen. Without being a part of a Christian organization, what have we got? I'm telling you, I mean, we look around in ourselves. We talked about it in Sunday school this morning. You look in, I don't even know this country. I'm 70 years old. I might not look it. I'm 70 years old, and I can't identify the United States of America today. There's so much anger, so much hatred, so much sin, so much degradation, and Christians are being not really persecuted per se in physical ways maybe but you can believe we're being persecuted we're trying to push us down as hard as they can the world you know in the bible the world talks about egypt when it talks about egypt a lot of times it's talking about the world yes. it's talking about people worshiping the world and we live in that and we're supposed to live in that and thrive in that because we have the Holy Spirit. Yes. We should be thriving. Yes. Look at the freedoms right now we have in this nation that we could be sharing one with another. I was at a service station the other day. I stopped to get a pack of chewing gum. Sometime I have heartburn and a little bit of chewing gum seems to help me. I, I guess it's the Pepsi in it. And I just stopped at this service station often and the lady that was in there, uh, I didn't recognize her. And so I go out and I get in the truck. The first thing I see in the truck is that one of these Bibles right here. Yeah. I says, you know, I've never offered her a Bible or asked her if she's saved. I don't know who she is. So I turn around and walk back in. I said, I don't, I don't want to take just a minute, but I said, the Holy Spirit moved on me to come back and give you God's holy word. I said, are you a Christian? She said, yeah. But she said, I'm not where I need to be. I said, well, thank you for, for confessing that. But I said, you can fix that. It's in the front of this Bible's what we call helps. And it's a place, if you're in a certain situation or condition in life, you can turn to it and get help. If you've been abused or if you're addicted or afraid or you're anxious, you're doubting God, you're failing, you're forgiveness, you want to forgive somebody or somebody forgive you, friends fail you. Mm -hmm. The scripture for all that, and I said, you can look in these helps and go directly to it. And I said, in the planned way of salvation is in the back, which is the Romans road. And I said, it's very easy for you to read that. And I said, I'm not gonna try to burden you with that right now. I know you've got customers in here. But I said, 
I'm available anytime you'd like to help. I, if you need some help in praying for you, I will be praying for you to get you back where you need to be with the Lord. And she said, thank you so much. You don't know how much I needed that today. You see, the Holy Spirit works. It's, he's working all the time. We just got to pay attention. Amen. We've all got the tools. If you're a Christian, you got the tools. You may not have a Bible, but you've got a memory verse somewhere. Right. We've done one this morning. You got a piece of scripture, you know, somewhere that you can share with somebody. You can just say, I, have, I, I got a feeling that maybe I need to pray for you today. Is that all right? And just say a little short prayer for somebody. That's what we need to do. That's what God is telling us to do. That's what he's commanded us to do. He said, you're going to go. He didn't ask us if we wanted to. He says, you shall be witnesses unto me. And as we think of the Ukraine and what's going on over there, I know there's people reaching out. I want to share something that happened in 2002 to me, and I was thinking of not sharing this this morning. I don't normally do this. I don't know why it came to me over this week to share this testimony. Because it's not a salvation testimony. It's a situation testimony. A situation that I was in one day, and, and I, it was about persecution. You know, we were, I was being persecuted a little bit, but they weren't nothing. And nobody bothered me, nobody scamped me, no, they just talked hard to me. But yet, what is that? My Lord, they hung our Savior on the cross, you know? It's all right for somebody to talk hard to you. Sometimes when people get it out, they open up where you can come back with something. You just have to be led of God. It was my first trip to the New York Blitz. I've been 18 years in a row. I had to skip the uh, last couple of years uh, because we are keeping the grandchild, and I was a little bit concerned about it. In 19, we couldn't go because uh, it was all over New York. COVID was all over New York. In 20, uh, I didn't go. It was still all over New York and when the time came. But 21, I had to miss it because uh, Stella uh, was there with us, and um, I, I couldn't take a chance of bringing it back to her, the, the COVID. So, uh, but I miss it. Uh, 18 years in a row, uh, I went up there. But this was 2002. It was the first time I participated in the New York Blitz. And that year, we had 11 men from Loris that went. And we were scattered out all over New York. We were never together, uh, this, hardly ever together. But uh, sometime, we, me and Dan worked together one day, I believe. But uh, I just reached NYU. NYU is, uh, is a big college in, in New York. In fact, it's all over New York. There's a flag flying, and you set blue flag flying with NYU on it. That means it's a part of their school. And we were at the main uh, campus, and I was there to distribute college students, uh, testaments to, Scott, to college students. I was on the sidewalk near the library. I had stacked up 10 boxes of testaments and was preparing to start interacting with students. About 30 feet away was Everett, selling used textbooks from a folding table. We were right on his 20-foot sidewalk there. That's about the way they are in Manhattan. And so Everett Sapiro, he walked over to me without saying a word. He walked up face to face to me, and he said, All you Christians deserve to die for what you have done. Mm. And he, I know he was referring to the Crusades. Uh, but I... Didn't have anything to do with the Crusades. That was way back yonder in Rome. And there was some atrocities uh, committed back in those days. And, but I simply said, well, I'm sorry you feel that way. And he stepped back without any response. About an hour went by, and, and uh, he came back. And letting the physical side of me rise up, I said to myself, what does this idiot want now? He said, I need to apologize to you for my rudeness. Wow. I didn't say a word. He said, I've been watching you. And he said, I don't see you doing anything wrong. You offer with a smile and they accept. Your work is commendable. Everett was an educated man and uh, 
I don't know what had happened to him, but he, he looked like a bum. He had on a, what I call a wife beater t-shirt, or undershirt, and it was kind of nasty. And grungy, beardy face and everything, but he was selling used books over there. And so uh, he said, your work is commendable. And I said, I asked, do you have a few minutes to we can talk? He said, yeah, I'd like that. So we sat down on the a, on a, on a edge of a brick planter, you know, a lot of times around buildings they have stuff planted. We sat down on the edge of that planter. And I asked him, and, uh, and uh, I said, what's your religious beliefs, Everett? Uh, we introduced ourselves to one another. And I told him I was uh, from South Carolina. He said, I knew you weren't from nowhere around here. I thought Texas. <clears throat> so we sat down on the edge of that uh, brick planter, and uh, we shared our names. And I said, what's your religious beliefs? He said, I don't have any. He said, there is no God. The world came into being from a cosmic explosion. He says, you live, you die, and that's it. And there's just that point blank about it. I reached over and pulled a leaf from a tree. God was in this too. Come on. I reached over and I pulled a leaf from a tree and I handed it to him and I asked him to look at it real close. It was a little dogwood leaf. So he looked at it. And I says, um, it has veins, chlorophyll, many other properties. I said, would you say it's a living thing? And he said, yes, I believe it's alive. It's green, it's pliable and everything. I said, have you ever heard of anything but chaos and destruction resulting from an explosion? Cosmic explosion. You ever heard of anything being created from that? He said, no, I, I know I, I have one. I said, by God's design, all things exist. We had a long, friendly talk, and he said he would not accept that. I asked, could I pray for his salvation? He said, that won't hurt anything. 2003, I returned to New York City. My first assignment was NYU. I unloaded in the same place, and there was none other but Everett Superior standing there at the same place he was before. As I was unloading the boxes, I turned to him and I said, Hey, Everett. He said, Hey, Bill. I said, How's everything going? He said, Everything's going great. I said, God saved you yet? He said, No, I'm just like I was. I said, I've been praying for you. He said, I bet you have. I said, Yeah. I've been praying to the Lord to save you. I said, you care if I ask other Christians and churches to pray for you? He said, no, I don't mind a bit. So he went from being a man that wanted me to die to a man I could carry on a conversation with. That's about all I felt like I could do at the time. Because God gives the increase. We do the planting. Somebody else waters. And God gives the increase. So it's not incumbent upon me to make sure everybody in the world is saved. But it is incumbent upon me to witness to everybody that I possibly can that the Holy Spirit is leading me to witness to. That's my responsibility. That's your responsibility. And this ministry is an opportunity to do that. It puts you in a place where you're not normally really comfortable, you know. I mean, I've talked to people about all kinds of things in the big city. I've talked to them in Loris. I've talked to them at Coastal. I've talked to them at colleges where we're doing, we're doing distribution. I've talked to them in hospitals. Had opportunities for people to tell me <coughs> in hospitals that they had someone who was real sick. And I said, well, let's pray for them. And it would lead to a discussion about salvation. I've had people to say to me, they found Bibles in the hospital. Their child or their mother or whatever was in coma, was in a coma, and they didn't know what to do, and they picked up that Bible, and they went in and just started reading it to them. 
I don't know if they, he said, I, I, one man told me, he said, I don't know if my wife could hear or not, but he said, I read, 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 read. They had told the family to come in, it was over. And he said, I read almost all night God's holy word. And he said, the numbers started getting better. And it wasn't long she was able to talk. And then she came out and she went home and she's okay. All kinds of things happen because people know they need God in their life. There's not a person in the world that's not been born with a God spirit within him to know that there is a God. Everybody, even the Indians do. I've been to Hawaii and they build totem poles and the Indians build totem poles. And all that's a form of worship to something they know is greater than them. They just haven't identified it yet. You know, Paul was walking through Athens and he looked at all these statues. And he said, I'm going to tell you about this one right here. You've got one here. You don't want to offend nobody. So you fixed one to the unknown gods. I'm going to tell you about him. You don't know him. But I'm going to tell you about him. Through Jesus Christ, you can have a relationship with him. Praise God for the opportunities we've had. I didn't know I'd been up here this long. I've enjoyed it, though. I hope you have. In memory, in recognition, getting card programs. We've got several people in this church. This church as a whole uses this program regularly. I thank you so much for doing it. By pay, giving $5, we can place a, a Bible in a hotel. And by the way, we just finished the Blitz last year, and we went over every piece of real estate in Myrtle Beach. And from Georgetown County to Marion County, we covered every hotel, hospital, doctor's office, nursing home, School, we covered everything that we could cover. We had men coming from all over the state and I believe seven other states to help us do the Myrtle Beach Blitz. And so your Bibles, the Bibles that you purchased are being placed right here around you and in other places. So thank you. Thank you for using this program. Thank you for your support in this ministry. And praise God for the opportunity to stand before you today, a man who loves the Lord. And I know you do too. Thank you and God bless you. Thank you for your gift. Brother Jim, I love you. Thank you, Bill Ward, for sharing the ministry of the Gideon. Something that I've cherished over the years is being a part of. And thank you, Dogwood Hill Baptist Church, for what you do. But listen to me this morning, media on uh, airways and in the church today if you're here and you don't know Jesus Christ you need to pick up that Gideon Bible uh, we at Dogwood I just recently a person asked me for a Bible said they didn't have a Bible and I went to my office I've got Bibles and I give them out uh, you, the best thing you can do is distribute the word of God amen that will uh, uh, save people. So with that being said today, I'd like for you to bow your heads. Heavenly Father, as we come on to you this morning, we thank you, dear Lord, for the Gideon ministry. We thank you, Lord, that they are uh, throughout the world, dear God, and they're spreading the gospel. Even there in the pretense of a, a prerequisition of the war in Ukraine, they've already distributed many scriptures to lead people to Christ. And you know, Lord, I thank you that you just didn't let a language barrier hinder a man from being saved. He had an interpreter. God, I thank you for that. I thank you, Lord, for their ministry. I thank you, Lord. Uh, for their uh, bill, they're going back to New York and meeting this same man. I pray, dear Lord, that uh, he has surrendered his heart to you. But God, if he hadn't, Lord, I pray for mercy upon him. But God, I pray today that you would minister unto those today that are in our midst. Some are on the airways or listening to us today. And Lord, uh, uh, many times I've seen it in the doctor's office and, and in the hospitals and in motel rooms, I've seen that Gideon Bible there as being a witness that the Word of God is strong. 
There's been people, Lord, that have been ready to take their life. Yes. And they'd open up a Gideon Bible. And, Lord, they would find Jesus Christ personal to them, dear Lord, and a Savior. And then they didn't want to do suicide no more. God, they wanted to live for you. You made instant change, dear God, in the lives of people through the very Word of God. Your Word is powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword, the Bible says. And, Lord, there it cut asunder. God, we just ask you now to minister into hearts this morning. There may be someone here today, Lord, that has not given their heart to thee. As Brother, Randall's, uh, Brother Brandon's going to stand up here with us. And, God, we're going to ask there if anyone uh, would uh, come to this altar, Lord, and surrender their heart. Uh, they, they may be in the, uh, that you've been dealing with them, Lord, and it may be today is the day of salvation. Today's the day that they're going to say, Lord, I've asked you to forgive me, and that's all I can do. And, Lord, here I'm presenting myself to be a living sacrifice, holy except unto you, God. Thank you for Bill Ward and the Gideon Minister. We're going to take up an offering in a few minutes. But, God, right now we've got this altar open that anyone that may need to come to this altar come and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Eddie, give us a song, a verse or two of some selection, please. 275, page 275, as we all stand, I surrender all. 